But this morning, we're going to look at maybe the tightest relationship that we're going to see throughout the whole series of whatever it takes. This person was incredibly close to Jesus, but the relationship, it kind of hit that really awkward moment. You know, and this person had let Jesus down in a pretty spectacular way. This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 21. So if you have a Bible, please turn there. Later, the, it'll be on the screens above, but John 21 is our chapter for today. Maybe you know what it's like to let someone down whom you love. You said you're going to do something, and you didn't do it, and now you have to deal with the consequences. I was trying to think of a way to illustrate this concept or this passage to you guys this weekend. Um, and so naturally, I texted my buddy from college, Richard, and I'm like, hey, man, have I ever let you down? I should have known. I should have known not to text someone that I lived with for two years that question because it was as if he was waiting for this very moment. And it's as if he had this Word document on his computer or on his notes section in his app, and he just unloads on me. And he goes, my, and one of my favorite moments or Kyle let down or dropped the ball moments that he mentioned was, hey, man, you remember that time when you were supposed to pick me up from the airport? Remember how you got there really early, and so you parked the car in the garage and fell asleep, and I was in the airport for two hours until you woke up and came and got me? And I was like, yeah, that was a good time. In my defense, he decided to fly into an airport that was two and a half hours from me at three in the morning. I was exhausted. I was a full-time college student. I was working. This guy texts me, and I'm like, all right, I'll come pick you up. I'm exhausted, right? Another letdown story, we were having Friendsgiving in Missouri, and this story is going to be the reason why I always sign up to bring the drinks. I don't, do, I don't do snacks. I don't bring the food. I bring drinks. That's it. I might get fancy, bring you cups, plasticware, plates, etc. But this is why I bring drinks, because somehow I agreed to bring potato salad. I know what you're thinking. Who eats potato salad at Thanksgiving? If you're one of those people, that's okay. That's all right. You're weird, but that's okay. Um, and so I'm, I make this potato salad, and we drive it to the place. I put it on the food table, and I walk away. I'm feeling good. I'm like, this is the first thing I've made since cereal. And so I see all these people getting in line at the food table. They're moving. They're getting the scoops of potato salad. I'm like, dang, everyone likes potato salad here. Because in Missouri... Potato salad is to Missouri as crabs are to Maryland for some reason. It's really weird. And so they're all eating it. And I'm looking around. I'm feeling good. I'm jiving. And they take a spoon. They go in for a bite. And they make the most disgruntled face. And immediately I'm thinking, nah, this is just that person. So I look over and disgruntled face. Another disgruntled face. And I'm like, what is going on? Well, I start rethinking the steps. I'm like, did I add the raisins? No, because that's weird. Who puts raisins in? Potato salad. Did I add the potatoes? Of course. Did I put some eggs in there? Yeah. I put mayo in there. Did I put sour cream? Oh, wait. I didn't put sour cream. I used cream cheese. Oh, no. I didn't even use good cream cheese. I used that vegan substitute cream cheese. Why was there vegan substitute in my apartment? Well, I dropped the ball. It was a bad idea. That one's on me. But that's why I only bring the drinks. So if, I, if you guys are ever having a party and I'm coming, just... Just know I'm bringing the drinks. Um, but in fact, in John 21, we look at a failure, right? More than potato salad, more than forgetting to pick up someone because you fell asleep. But it's, when, it, it's another attempt of trying your best and not succeeding. You said you were going to do something, and you didn't do it right, and you let someone down. And we're going to see that right here in John 21 in a pretty spectacular way. In fact, this failure threatened the very fabric of the relationship almost to the point where you weren't sure the relationship was going to survive. It was one of those moments. And in John 21, we're going to meet a guy named Peter. And if you're not all that familiar with the Bible, if, if church is completely new to you, I'm so glad that you're here. We're all so glad that you're here. So let me give you a quick backstory, a quick character summary of this guy, Peter. Politely put, Peter is one of those ready, fire, then aim you know, act first, think later, deal with the consequences later kind of people. So there was a time when Jesus was walking out to see his disciples, and his disciples were, a pe were, you know, his followers, people that were supposed to represent him, people that obeyed his teaching, that learned his teachings. And as he's walking to the disciples, Peter gets really excited. And Peter jumps out of the boat fully clothed, and he starts to walk towards Jesus until he looks down and realizes 
as he's walking on the water, oh, wait, science doesn't work this way, takes his eyes off Jesus and starts to sink. Another moment where Peter doesn't act before, or Peter acts before he thinks is when the Roman guards come to arrest Jesus, right? And Peter, in the moment, he takes out his sword, and he tries to defend Jesus. And I don't know if he was going for the head or if he has spectacular aim, but he cuts off the guard's ear, and Jesus is like, no, Peter, this isn't what we're doing today. He takes the ear, pops it on the guard, Mr. Potato Head style, and, (laughs) yeah, Mr. Potato Head style, right? And he looks at Peter, and he's like, that's not what we're doing, dude. And immediately Peter's like, all right, my bad. But Peter was this guy that acted first and thought later. But to Peter's credit, before he becomes too disparaging for us, he's actually one of the most courageous people in the Bible. He was bold in his faith. He claimed Jesus for who he was unlike anyone else. Peter deserves a lot of credit. And in fact, I find myself in the life of Peter, and maybe you will too, because Peter's life, there were temporary moments of brilliance followed by temporary seasons of disaster. And maybe you, can, maybe you understand that, I do. There are times where I think I have it all together. Right? I think I have it all together. I do the right things, but then the very next day I mess up, and it's a complete disaster. In John 21, we find Peter in a real awkward moment because he promised he wouldn't do something, and then he did it, and now he's trying to, do, he's trying to figure out what to do next. Let's rewind a bit. In the later life of Jesus, he's having a dinner party with his disciples, the people that follow him, right? And they, these people are, you know, his disciples. They're his followers. They represent him. They know his teaching, all that good stuff. And as the dinner party's going on, Jesus starts to foreshadow his own death coming up. And remember, Peter is in the audience of this. As Jesus is foreshadowing his death, Peter's hearing this, and Peter doesn't think. He just acts and then thinks. Peter's like, wait, that's ridiculous, Jesus. I'm not going to let you die. I'll fight for you. I'll defend you. I'll go to the stake for you, Jesus. I'm not going to let you die. And that's what he tells him. And then when you fast forward in the story just a little bit further, Jesus has been arrested and he's undergoing this illegal trial and Peter's there. And Peter is tiptoeing around reality. He's worried about Jesus' safety. He's worried about his own safety. And he's currently there in the moment huddled, in a charcoal, huddled around a charcoal fire. And that night, Peter had three opportunities, three opportunities to follow his word, to be the leader that he thought he was. And in these three opportunities, these people asked him, do you know that guy? Aren't you Jesus' follower? Aren't you one of his disciples? And in every single opportunity, all three of them, Peter denied it. And in the Gospel of Luke, we read, we read that the third time that Peter denies Jesus, Jesus looked at him, that he made eye contact. Can you imagine the weight of that moment? The moment where you are in your darkest moment and you make eye contact with Jesus? The English translation in Luke says, and he went out and wept bitterly. But sometimes I think the English doesn't translate the depth of the Greek emotion. And so the Greek says, kai exelthon, exo, o petros, ekleson, pikros. And that translates to, Peter left violently and Peter wept violently. Peter was crushed. He was humiliated. I mean, the darkest moment he sees Jesus look at him as he denies him, He's crushed. And what we see Peter do right there in that moment is follow a path that you and I know all too well. In fact, it's a path that we do on a daily basis. It's really simple. It begins with three steps, and it begins with this. I said I wouldn't, but then I did, and now what? Does anybody know that path? I said I wouldn't do that thing. I wouldn't go back to that relationship. I was going to change my life. Then I didn't. Now what? I said I wasn't going to cut corners at work anymore, but that project was due, and my coworkers weren't carrying their weight, so I had to cut a few corners, but at least I got the project in. Or you and your boyfriend, maybe, were, you committed to one another. You said you weren't going to be late alone anymore, and then you were, and that thing happened. Now what? Or maybe you said you were going to delete that app off your phone, but you didn't, and you saw those images again. Now what? All of us know what that now what moment feels like when we're asking that question, now what? And if we're honest, what we really mean is, now what does God think of me? 
what am I supposed to do? How do I get back into God's good graces? In John 21, we're going to find Peter in the midst of his now what? He said he wouldn't, then he did, now what? Historically speaking, Jesus has been crucified and he's been buried, he's been resurrected, and Jesus has already appeared to his disciples twice before John 21, but it was always in a group setting. And so Peter has seen Jesus. He's seen the resurrected Jesus walk around, eat, hang out with people, but he's never gotten the chance to be with him one-on-one. And can you imagine the anxiety? You know, this whole time that Peter is seeing Jesus walk around, laughing, having a good time, the anxiety that would cause, the desire to just go up to Jesus and say, hey, man, I'm sorry. You know, I just want to explain myself. I just need forgiveness. I want to apologize. The anxiety that would cause to see Jesus walking around, and Peter doesn't get that opportunity until right now in John 21. And we read that Peter was hanging out with some of the other disciples at a place called the Sea of Tiberias. And because they're guys, they don't sit around and talk about their feelings. They're fishing. And, you know, that's just what we do. So these former professional fishermen, they had a terrible night of fishing. They didn't catch anything. And as the sun was rising, the shadowy figure on the shore starts to appear, and he calls out to the disciples saying, hey, why don't you cast your net on the other side? As if professional fishermen didn't already think that. Nonetheless, they cast the net on the other side, and they catch so much fish, so so much fish that they can't even haul it. And this, this moment unlocks a memory in the minds of John and Peter. And they're like, wait a minute, this sounds all too familiar. I've seen this movie before. Jesus did this before. That's not some shadowy figure. That's Jesus. And Peter now has his moment, and he's not going to miss it. And Peter, the ever-impulsive one, jumps into the water, fully clothed, and swims to shore. And he doesn't wait for the boat to get there. He just needs to talk to Jesus. He's so desperate that he's been waiting for this moment to talk to Jesus and have this very crucial conversation. So we're going to pick up here this morning in verse 15, John chapter 21. Jesus kicks off the conversation, and he says this, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. So this is the first one-on-one conversation that Jesus and Peter have had since that thing had happened. And they've been there, they've been talking on the beach. They just finished their breakfast, and they're having this conversation. Jesus kicks it off with a question, and it may seem a little odd at first. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the these that are in question are the other disciples. So essentially what Jesus is asking, Peter, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? And at first glance, that kind of seems like an odd question. Is Jesus playing favorites? Is he trying to make them compete? Why would he ask such a question? But what Jesus is doing is that he's making a point because Peter, in fact, did love Jesus more than the other disciples did because Peter knew exactly what Jesus had forgiven him of. You see, James and John, they could only imagine the pain, the despair that Peter was living with. Thomas and Nathaniel, they could attempt to understand and empathize with Peter, but no one knew the grief that Peter had but Peter and Jesus. No one knew what it was like to make eye contact with Jesus during that dark moment. See, Peter was incredibly aware of the sin that he had committed. He was incredibly aware that Jesus had forgiven him of that sin. And because of that, that produced a great love in him that exceeded all the other disciples. And when you and I, when we come to full grips with what exactly Jesus has forgiven us from, we'll produce the same type of love in our lives as well. But here's the problem. Here's the challenge for many of us. If we misunderstand our sin will underappreciate his grace. If we misunderstand our sin, we'll underappreciate his grace. This is truly a problem for some of us. More specifically, if we misunderstand the weight of our sin, if we misunderstand the gravity and the darkness and the prevalence of our sin, then we'll underappreciate the grace, right? You see, if we pull back all the layers and we get super honest and we get really real, there are some, there are some of us that have come to the conclusion that God really didn't save us from all that much. When we had some messes, yeah, we had some discretions, and maybe we weren't perfect, but God didn't really save me from all that much. The only way that we can get to that conclusion is by playing the sin comparison game. Have you ever played that? It's, it's pretty awful. I hope you guys don't play it. But here's how it works. It's really simple. You look at your sin. You acknowledge your sin. You say, here's my mess. Here's my junk. Here's my sin. And then you look at someone else, 
and you look at their darker sin, their bigger sin, and immediately you start feeling better. That's the sin comparison game. You know, you start saying, at least I'm not like them, right? At least I don't sin that way. At least I don't do that. At least I'm not, you know, a terrorist, right? I'm not a terrorist. I'm as if that's the bar that Jesus had set. At least I'm not going around killing people. I'm not one of those evil people, right? At least I'm not like one of those people who when they put the toilet paper on the roll, it's facing the wall instead of away the wall like God had intended it to be. You know what I mean? What we do, what we often say is, yeah, I've got a mess and I've messed up, but I'm not like that. Honestly, I'm doing okay. I'm relatively a pretty good person. So God really didn't have to save me from that much. And we know that we can't say that because it sounds super arrogant. We, there's no way that we'd actually say that out loud. But here's how we do say it. When someone asks us about our story, we say things like, you know, I just don't have that much of a testimony. Or when I'm telling my salvation story, I really don't know who would want to hear it because I had a pretty good background. I had a pretty normal life. And what we're saying is, God really didn't save me from all that much. I was a pretty good person who just needed a little bit of help, but I didn't need to be saved from anything. And if it's possible, maybe you walked yourself to that conclusion. But I'd like to give you some biblical evidence that might persuade your conclusion otherwise. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Paul's making it very clear. He's saying that every single one of us has fallen short. Every single one of us has sinned. There is no distinction, no disqualifier, no parameters. He says every single one of us has fallen short. That verse is meant to pull us all on the same level, but you and I, we have this tendency to kind of rank sin as if there are certain categories or certain tiers. We say, as long as I stay in this tier one and never get to tier three, I can feel pretty good about myself. There's no evidence of that in the Bible, but that's what you and I do. So Paul is saying, no, no distinction. Every single one of us has fallen short. And we say, okay, that's fine, but I only did the light sin. I, I haven't done any of that heavy sin. And Paul says, no. Romans chapter 6 says, For the wages of sin, not some sins, not those sins, not tier 3 sins, the wages of sin, the consequences of sin, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul is making two things very, very clear. Every single one of us has sinned, and the consequence for every single sin is death. There's no such thing as death penalty sins or slap on the wrist types of sin. He's saying every single one of them leads to death, even the ones that you and I try to rationalize. The wages of gossip, death. The wages of slander, death. The wages of greed, death. The wages of lust, death. The wages of envy, death. So we see that the Bible is clear here. There aren't certain sins that are far worse than the other. Every single one of us has fallen short, and every single one of us was headed toward death, except Jesus stepped in, and that changed everything. In fact, to paraphrase Tim Keller, he wrote it like this, My sin is far worse than I think, but his grace is better than I can imagine. My sin, and I'm talking about me right now, my sin is worse than I think. There are days that I try to avoid that reality. There are days that I try to compare myself to the people I hang out with, to the people that I see every day. I try to compare myself to the people on the news. I try to make myself feel better as if I'm not really all that bad. But the truth is, my sin is worse than I think. It is far more prevalent than I'd ever want to admit. But his grace is far better than I could ever imagine. See, I don't know if you realize it, but in every book, Paul writes it like this. He says, here, look, here's the reality of sin. It's worse than we think, but his grace is better. His grace is bigger. His grace is stronger. His grace is more than capable of carrying your sin. So here's why that matters. Here's why we've only gotten through one verse this morning or why we've only answered one question this morning. It's because we have to understand that our gratitude, the degree to which we are grateful to God, our, we are grateful to God for grace is directly tied to our understanding of sin. The level of gratitude that we will have toward God for saving us from our sin is absolutely tied to the way that we understand the reality of our sin. 
And if we think that we are primarily good people who just needed a little bit of help or that God didn't really save us from all that much, then we won't develop the gratitude and the affection that God deserves. In fact, to quote Jesus a little bit in Luke chapter 7, he said, but he, is, but he who is forgiven little loves little. So for us, when we realize exactly what God has saved us from, which is not just some slap on the wrist or some minor indiscretion, but rather from the depths of hell, then we will develop the gratitude and the love that Peter had on the beach that morning. Let's rejoin the conversation in verses 16 and 17. Jesus says to Peter, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd, my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. So here on the beach after breakfast, Jesus and Peter are having a conversation and, and Jesus asks the same question three different times. Peter, do you love me? And the imagery isn't lost on Peter. He knew what Jesus was doing. He was talking about that thing that happened. Jesus was hugging the awkward. He was addressing the elephant in the room. Jesus was going after the moment. And we have to ask the question, why would Jesus do it like that? Was he trying to be passive aggressive? Was he just trying to bring it in, bring it up so he could just rub Peter's face into it? What was Jesus doing? What we see right here is something that Jesus does in his interactions. Jesus was leading Peter to conviction and not condemnation. Those two things are totally different. They're completely different. For us as Christians, we need to understand just why those two concepts are different. Jesus was leading Peter to conviction and not condemnation. See, when you and I have our spectacular failures, and every single one of us does, we often find ourselves falling on our face and making a mess, and we just get riddled with a bunch of emotion. I learned a new word this weekend, and it's appropriate for this moment. I'm going to teach it to you. We're going to expand our vocabulary, and you can impress all your friends. Just the only downside to this new word is that it's not technically a real word. So if you look it up in the dictionary, it's not going to be there. But I love this word. I think it should be a word, and it's the word pregret. Pregret is when you regret something that you're about to do. It's preemptive regret right? Preemptive regret. So when you walk into the house and you're welcomed by that beautiful aroma of Nestle Toll House chocolate chip cookies and you pregret eating 13 of them, <laughs> you pregret that, right? You know you're going to be sick of it, but you pregret, right? Or maybe you're a man of a certain age and you have yet to come grips with that. So when a couple of young guns come up to you and they're like, hey, let's play basketball, and you say yes, knowing that you're going to pregret it because you're going to feel awful in the morning, that's pre -gret. You're welcome. I taught you a new word. You can impress all your friends. Now, on a much serious note, there are two things that overwhelm our hearts in our moments of despair. And these two things are shame and conviction. And these things are actually really different. And what Jesus is doing is leading Peter to one and not the other. You see, shame is humiliation for what we feel. Or rather, shame is the humiliation that we feel for what we've done. Humiliation because we got caught. Humiliation because people now know. Humiliation because our reputation will never be the same. But what happens is shame rarely leads to healthy behavior. Shame leads to things like despair and isolation and maybe depression. And the most twisted thing that shame does is that it threatens to become our identity. In fact, no longer is that a thing that we did. It's now who we are. And Peter was dangerously close to allowing his shame to become the rest of his identity. The for that forever he was going to be known as the guy that wasn't brave, that he wasn't able to, to stick up to the game that he was walking, or the game that he was talking about. He was the guy that denied Jesus three times. But here's the thing, Jesus knows about Peter, and he knows this about us. Shame is an unacceptable destination. You and I, Peter, we can't live there. So what Jesus was doing is that he was walking Peter from shame to a different place called conviction. Conviction is very different from shame. See, conviction is when we look at our sin dead in the eye and call it for what it is. We stop playing games. We stop shifting the blame. We stop everything else, and we look at our sin and call it for what it is. Conviction leads to a healthy behavior called repentance. Repentance is a fancy word that really means I was headed down one way, headed for sin and destruction, and now I'm turning around. 
I'm turning around through the power of the Spirit, and I'm headed back toward God. That's what repentance is. So Jesus is walking Peter through this conversation, asking him those questions, not to condemn him, because he knew that shame was an unacceptable destination for Peter, and it's an unacceptable destination for you and me, and that's what's happening on that beach. Now, there are some of you who are hearing this, and you're stuck in your shame. Your humiliation is debilitating. It's threatening to not only consume you, but become your identity. And if you think that's the end of your story, may I lovingly point you back to the conversation between Jesus and Peter on the beach. You see, because Peter betrayed Jesus. He denied Jesus, and in the moment when Jesus needed him the most, Peter was a coward and ran away, and Jesus forgave him, and he set him on a new path. See, Peter's story did not end in shame. It began with conviction and led to repentance and now has a truer and better purpose. And let's, let's look at what happens in verses 18 and 19. Because Jesus wraps up this conversation saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk, whatever, walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God, and what he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus has now led Peter from shame to repentance. He's moved him from crushing guilt to redeeming purpose. And because Peter truly understood the weight of his sin, he fully appreciated the impact of Jesus' grace. And he lived the rest of his life self-aware, as a self-aware sinner saved by grace. And in this moment on the beach, we see that grace is more than some get-out-of-hell-free card that we put on the bookshelf for the day that we somehow die, but grace is something that changes our lives. See, here's the truth for Peter, and here's the truth for you and me. We were saved from something for something. You and I were saved from something for something, right? Peter was saved from his betrayal for the purpose of ministry. So maybe you don't know the rest of Peter's story, but the same guy The same guy who was too afraid to stand up for Jesus in the face of opposition is the same guy who wussed out would go on to preach the very first sermon in the history of the church and watch 3,000 people come to the faith in Jesus that day. And that's an incredible turnaround. But that's no credit to Peter. It's not because of his intellect. It's not because Peter deserved it. It's because that's what happens when grace takes over. We can turn around and we can do things that we never possibly imagined because of God's spirit alone. We were saved from something for something. So I have a couple questions that we're going to wrap up with today. I want you to ask yourself these questions. Ask the people you love these questions. The first question is this, from what have you been saved? Now there are some of you who are hearing this and you received the gift of grace. You did it. Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, but it was a while ago. And the good news, it kind of became old news. And in this season of life, you've kind of become convinced that maybe you weren't all that bad to begin with. And maybe you actually are a pretty good person, and what you've done is you've just lost appreciation for what God saved you from, and that your gratitude had deteriorated over time. And so today is the day when you can wake up. And you can say, God, I remember. I remember that not only did I need you back then, but I need you today because I'm still a mess. I'm still a work in progress. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. And there are some of you, and you can't answer that question yet because you have yet to receive Jesus. And maybe there are a bunch of reasons why you kept him at arm's length, and you kind of stiff-armed Jesus for a long time, and maybe you've convinced yourself that you don't need him. You think that you're a good person who does relatively good things. You've got some pretty good relationships. Sure, you mess up every now and then and on occasion, but you don't really need to be saved from anything. I can't convince you of much. All I'm saying is that the word of God has some different verses that might offer a different conclusion. And the beautiful thing is that we don't have to avoid that truth anymore. We don't have to be ashamed of our sin because Jesus saved us from it. And we can just self-admit, and I'll stand here and self-admit all day that I needed to be saved and that I'm a sinner saved by grace, and that's all I am, and I have nothing to boast but other than Christ Jesus. And maybe you're convinced that you don't need Jesus. Maybe you're convinced that you don't deserve Jesus. Maybe because of your past or your mess and maybe because of the things you've done, you've convinced yourself that grace is for the 99.9% of people. For some reason, you're just in that .01. And you think, if you had been there, Kyle, or Jesus, if you saw me, if you heard me, if you were around for what I did back then, again, I just want to point you back to the beach. 
I want to point you back to that conversation between Peter and Jesus. I want to point you back to that relationship and how Peter betrayed Jesus, how Peter denied Jesus, and yet he was still saved. I was still saved. And there are a lot of people around you who have been saved, and you can too. Grace is strong enough and big enough for whatever junk that you might bring in. Jesus wants to give you the free gift of grace today. So here's the second question. The first question was, from what have you been saved? The second question is, for what purpose have you been saved? Again, we were all saved from something for something. There is something to do about this. For what purpose? Again, Jesus didn't redeem and restore Peter so he could just go fishing with his buddies and hang out with everyone and not go to hell. That wasn't, that wasn't the story. In fact, Jesus redeemed Peter so that he would live his life on fire for Jesus, and he did. He preached sermons, he planted churches, he even went to go die for Jesus at one point. So the question is this, what is God calling you to do? What is he calling you to do? Now, if you've lived in the church long enough, you might hear this word calling, and it kind of takes on this mystical proportion, like some of you might be waiting for an angel to, to you know, descend from heaven with lights and some hearts and say, hey, thus saith the Lord, you shall serve in kids' ministry. That would be really helpful, but I don't think it's going to work that way. But here's what it is. Calling doesn't have to be complicated. We can reduce it to this. What are you good at, and how can you serve Jesus with that? What are you good at, and how can you save Jesus with it? Serve Jesus with it, rather. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. What are you good at? What are the skills that you have? What are your resources? What's your personality like? And how can you use that for Jesus? That's your calling. And that's what you do with the gift of grace. We didn't do anything to earn it, but now we can do something in response to it. Jesus didn't go to the cross to die for our sins so that we, could, so that we would live a life passively hoping for some day that we would avoid the fire. That wasn't the big story, and that wasn't the goal. God not only, not only saved us for eternity, he saved us for the life that he intended for us today. The beautiful part about the gospel is something called a testimony. The life of Jesus is filled with healing and love and redemption, and each of us were saved from something. We talked about four different types of people earlier. Person A, this person has yet to, or rather, this person who has accepted the good news, but it kind of became old news, right? Person B is the person who kind of just lost, who lost appreciation for what God saved them from. Person C, this person has convinced themselves that they don't need Jesus. And then you have person D. This person believes that Jesus just doesn't want them, right? That grace is for the 99.9. Your testimony, your story, that speaks about what God saved you from and for, that might be the tool that God just wants to use to be able to crack those four perspectives. God saved you from something for something. You know what's tough about the Bible? We get something called the Great Commission, right? I don't know if you guys have heard it. It's found in Matthew 28, but it's called the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is really tough because it's a commission. It's called the Great Commission and not the Great Suggestion. So it kind of means that we have to do it, right? Well, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it reads this. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. There are four different types of people in those categories that we talk about, four different perspectives. Your story about how God saved you from might be the thing that God wants to use to open the eyes of those perspectives. Testimony fits into this whatever it takes series because testimony is tough. It's so tough to give a testimony because it's personal. It gets too deep, it gets too dark, it goes into emphasis about the sin that we have. And testimony, are you willing to do whatever it takes? That might mean sharing your testimony, sharing the darkness, the depravity of sin. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? A couple months ago, um, I preached a sermon on prayer, and uh, I ended up, uh, one of the illustrations I used, I flew over to Texas because my best friend Richard, the guy that was haggling me about falling asleep in the airport, he, uh, he called me and he told me that his father had passed away. And his father, his name was Rick, and he, he, he's amazing. He, um, he sent me money for books. 
He made sure I was eating on the weekends. He would call to check up on me. And when, he ca- when Richard had called me about his father's passing, I, I knew I had to do something, and I flew over to Texas. Not even a month later, on uh, January 20th, Richard called me, and he told me that his fiance was in a car accident. Not even a whole month later. And I, and I remember I was with our high school boys small group leader, Adam Kimball, and one of our high school students, Michael Lewis, and we were getting smoothies one night, and, and I was picking them up, and I pick up Micah, and I'm like, hey, man, just want to let you know this is what's going on. And I get to Adam's house, and he gets in the car. And I get this text. And Richard tells me that she's gone. Not even a month later. And this is my best friend. I'm a thousand miles away. So being young and full of energy, I, um, I, got, I booked a flight, and I flew to Missouri. And I spent a whole week with him, and and it was great. I wish it was on better circumstances, but I was glad I could have been there. You know, Richard and I, we went to a Bible college. We we were preparing to be in the ministry. We loved Jesus. We wanted to chase after that calling. And I looked at him, and I said, Richard, if if you want to take a break, you know, if you want to put a pause on life right now, that's okay. No one would be upset. No one would blame you. That's okay. And Richard looks at me and he goes, Kyle, you know this better than I do. The, the darkness that God saved me from, the pain, the separation, the sin, right now this sucks and it hurts. But if you knew the things that God saved me from, if you knew that God saved me and later on I'm going to be able to see my dad and I'm going to be able to see my fiance again, if you knew the sin that he saved me from so I could do those things, how could I walk away from the ministry? If anything, this solidifies my reasoning for ministry. I felt so dumb. Because here I am, giving him a cop out, and he's saying, I'm ready. This sucks right now, but bring, bring it on. I know what my calling is. This is going to be part of my testimony. This is my story, and this is how God is still good, even in the darkness. Testimony's tough. But will you use your, sto- your story, your testimony, something that's unique to you and only you, to radiate God's glory? Please stand and pray with me.